West. Good morning. Good morning to our world congregation as they worship with us through the simulcast. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, two days before Christmas, uh, you may be a bit interested in my scripture selection. Uh, it is because we here at Colonial are on an epic journey through the Gospel of Luke. And I have uh, felt commissioned by the Lord just to continue on um, with where we're at, which leads us to this uh, famous passage of Scripture that nobody preaches on called The Six Woes to the Pharisees. Kind of light stuff for Christmas, right? And, uh, but I want, you to, I want you to bear with me because I really do believe that one of the things we say a lot, and, and I think we mean it, is that we wish that somehow we could capture the spirit of Christmas, the joy of Christmas, the celebration of a Savior born unto us, you know, all year around. And, and I would submit to you that, that this scripture today can help you with that. Because what it does is it helps us to understand who we are and how we are in that every day. Every day we need a Savior. Every day our condition is such that we would be lost without him. And, and, and Jesus loves us enough to point this out to us uh, if we can relate with this text. And I think a lot of us can. So let's turn to uh, Luke 11, verses 37 through 44. And if you would, just stand for the reading of God's word and we'll see how far we can get today. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee, noticing that Jesus did not first wash before the meal, was surprised. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But give what is inside the dish to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which men walk over without knowing it. Please be seated. Lord, this is a, a tough passage this time of the year, but I trust that your Holy Spirit will come to reveal to us and make clear to us how this speaks into our, our lives, into our circumstances, into our culture, into this season of Christmas. Help us to understand once again who you are and who we are and, and why we need a Savior and that he is Christ the Lord. Amen. So the, the context of this story is very much the same as it's been the last couple of weeks as we've been in the Gospel of Luke. It's the same day. Jesus has come into a village with his entourage. He comes upon a man who is demon-possessed, and he casts down the demon. The demon had kept the man from having a voice, and the man speaks. And a lot of people are amazed, but a lot of people are are still skeptical, and some ask for signs, more signs. They want signs from heaven, and Jesus responds to that. That's where we were last week. Now, after he finishes responding to these skeptics of, in the crowd, we understand that there's this group of religious authorities, Pharisees and scribes, the most religious kind of devout group of people who are standing nearby, and one of the Pharisees comes alongside of Jesus and says, you know, come on over to my house. Let me have you for dinner. And that's, that's where we're going to uh, pick up our story today. But before we get there, I owe you an explanation. I mean, right we're two days before Christmas, you're thinking, what in the world does any of this have to do with Christmas? Well, I think this story is largely about Jesus commenting quite directly on his perception and his unhappiness with external religious symbolism. And no time in our culture do we see more demonstrations of external religious symbolism than Christmas, right? Christmas in America. I mean, we drive through our neighborhoods, we see Christmas lights up and down the street. People have nativity scenes and stars and inflatable Santas on their lawns. And everywhere you go, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And what does Christmas look like? It looks cheerful. It looks red and white and blinkly. That's not a word. Uh, <laughs> twinkly. And, 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 and there's chestnuts on an open fire, and there's one horse open sleighs, and the halls are decked, 
and the presents are wrapped, right? I mean, it's just a wonderful time. People are bringing out these boxes of special decorations and special sweaters and special smiles that they haven't put on since last year. And, and then, you know, suddenly we kind of have this nagging sense that we should do something good for somebody else, you know, so we, we help out buying gifts for needy children or we give a bit more to the church. And then, you know, we just have this warm sense of nostalgia because of all the memories of days gone by and we treasure up these traditions, these Yuletide traditions and expressions of this season of goodwill towards men. And it looks like, I would think, you know, from an outside perspective that for a few weeks here, we become a very religious and a very generous group of people. Now I understand that this concept and this picture of, sacred, uh, of the sacred Christmas traditions is so very special to all of you and but I want to prepare you what's coming, you know, for what's coming here. We're fixing to hear from the real Jesus, and you need to be ready for his rebuke. Jesus is going to clearly express his discontent with external religious symbolism. And quite frankly, I mean, that does sum up our cultural Christmas, doesn't it? Why? Because you know and I know that behind some of the most decorated doors and beautiful houses are broken marriages, are rebellious teenagers, porn addictions, chronic resentment, unforgiveness, idolatry even, witchcraft even, wanton materialism, and all sorts of kind of mess, right? Darkness and, and unfaithfulness. In other words, a lot of times the Christmas cheer is this exterior shine that is an attempt to kind of cover up a lack of internal spiritual substance. And that is exactly what Jesus is going to address in this text. Now my goal for this message is not to pop your Christmas balloon. It, it is not to kind of disillusion you. It, not at all. You know, every one of us who are sitting here today who would say, no, Jesus is the reason for the season, right? Well, if that's the case, then it stands to reason that we might want to hear what he has to say. And what Jesus has to say here in Luke 11 should once again do what it usually does. I mean, usually when you hear Jesus talk, it leads you to repentance. Repentance is always the goal of the New Testament, and it's a wonderful thing if you can see yourself and repent. Why? Because then you're kind of, you're begging for forgiveness, and, and what do we need for forgiveness? We need a Savior, right? And that is what Christmas is about. So I want you to tune in to how Jesus is going to address a group of people who are very good at hanging lights and honoring age-old traditions. Our story this morning begins with Jesus being invited to dine at the house of this Pharisee along with a host of his buddies, other Pharisees and scribes. Now keep in mind what just happened. Jesus engaged with two groups of skeptics, those who accused them of working for Satan and then those who demanded more signs from heaven. And he's been dealing, and these people we assume are in the crowds, and the crowds are very large. But now this Pharisee and his buddies, they don't associate themselves with those crowds. In fact, they think of themselves as so far kind of above and better than all these people that whatever rebuke or whatever teaching just Jesus just gave to these crowds, they're not listening. I mean, they don't think of themselves as those people. There's a real gap between the Pharisees and scribes and then your general Jewish peasant. And so these guys are thinking, we're the city fathers, we're the, the elders of this village, and we're going to invite this interesting young man into our home so we can scrutinize him, so we can kind of pick him apart and see what he's made of, and, and uh, you know, we stand in a position to critique him. So that's what this dinner is about. Now, as the meal gets about to be served, you have to understand that within this culture, every one of these esteemed religious leaders would go through a very ceremonial, sanctimonious washing of their hands. Why? Because their whole religion is based upon cleanliness about being perceived as clean. And everyone would have done a very thorough job of washing their hands, and the, the wash bowl would have gone around from person to person. When it comes to Jesus, he says, no. He abstains from the ceremonial hand washing. And the text says that the host, Pharisee, was surprised that Jesus did not wash before the meal. We don't know what the Pharisee actually said, but I suspect his indignant body language said it all. Right? And Jesus sees this. He sees his host with his indignant surprise. And so he, uh, he kind of lays into him a bit. He says, now, you Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside also make the inside? 
Now, here, here's what Jesus is saying in this rebuke. It, it kind of should hit home for a lot of us. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes are very concerned about their outward appearances of you know, being spiritually rigorous kind of people. Their religion was based upon this, this sense of cleanliness. Their righteousness was based upon achievable external disciplines and accomplishments that earned them a great deal of respect in their community. Jesus says, you're fools. I mean, that's a very strong rebuke from Christ. You're fools. You obsess over washing the outside of the cup and dish, but you neglect the inside. No, no, no. Okay, we're about to have big Christmas meal, right? And some of us are going to get stuck with the dishes. Not sure, it's probably me. Uh, so imagine you have that big roasting pan, right? The one you put your ham in or your turkey. And, and it's your job to wash the dish. And so you take the hot soaps of water and, and you take your sponge and you wash the outside of the pan. And then you put it up on the shelf and it looks great, right? But you didn't touch the inside of the pan. And days go by. Weeks go by. What's happening inside of that pan? It's nasty. I mean, it's nasty. There's mold and mildew, rot and stench. Now, the pan looks fine on the outside, right? But inside it's filthy and it's getting worse with time. It doesn't get better with time. It gets worse. And if you were to serve anything from inside of that pan, it's going to be nasty and infected, right? Now, in light of that ridiculous picture that Jesus just painted, he's then asked the question, did not the one who made the outside also make the inside? Here's what he's saying. Do you actually think that God is blind to what's going on inside of you, inside of your heart? Do you actually believe that God will be impressed and reward your sparkling exterior while the substance of what lies within is rotten? God made both our bodies and our spirits. God sees it all. The true value of man is not to be seen from the exterior. It is his substance. It's the quality of his character. Why is that? Well, because what we primarily have to offer one another, what we primarily have to offer God comes from within. Let's just stick with the same kind of example there for a second. Say you take this pan down after a month of it sitting up there, and you're going to serve a meal. You're going to have a bunch of friends over, and we're going to serve a meal. Now, what's going to influence the quality of the meal that you're going to serve? Is it the fact that there's some scarring, maybe some carbon residue on the outside of the pan when you sit it on the burner? No. I mean, let's face it. I don't know about your house, but a lot of, like some of the pans in our house, they're looking kind of bad on the outside. They kind of have black marks and different things, right? But on the inside, it's clean. But see, Jesus says it's just the opposite for you guys. You Pharisees, you're so obsessed about the cleanliness on the outside, but what you have to serve anybody comes from what's inside. And it's infected. And everything you serve is infected. It's greed, it's, it's evil. I mean, he doesn't really beat around the bush here, does he? And so Jesus is going to go on, and he, he, now verse 41 sounds a bit confusing. The NIV reads this way, but give what is inside the dish to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Given the illustration I was just using, that's like gross, don't do that, right? But Jesus is saying more than that. It goes with verse 42. Look at verse 42. It says, Woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and love of God. Now, we have to put these two things together, but before we do, I want to correct verse 41. Sometimes the NIV goes so far as to interpret a verse versus simply translate the verse. But I want you to know, if you just look at the Greek, the Greek doesn't include the word dish. It says, but give for alms those things from within, and Jesus just defined those, justice and the love of God. And everything is clean in you. Not will be, but is. The evidence of what's happening inside is what comes out. Justice and the love of God. It should go to the poor. It should be an encouragement to the poor. It should be encouragement to the world. Now, here's what he's saying, and you put all this together. He's saying you, you're obsessed with what's on the outside. You ignore what's on the inside. But what I expect from you what needs to come out of you is justice and the love of God. What are they obsessed with? They're obsessed with tithing. Now, th this, this is, bears some explanation. Tithing goes all the way back to Leviticus 27.30. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And this concept of tithing began to be very, very developed in the Jewish Midrash. Remember the Midrash or the Mishnah are larger bodies of oral tradition that the Pharisees drew upon. It's not the Bible. 
But these Pharisees became professional tithers, and they loved to tell everybody about their tithing. In fact, we have a story someday when we get to Luke 18. I'll tell you the story, but I'll read it to you real quickly. This Pharisee uh, enters into the temple at the same time as a tax collector, right, the dreaded tax collector. And the Pharisee stands up and says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. Now, Jesus has heard this very kind of pompous attitude in the temple. And so in verse 41, he says, you should give for alms. You should give of your tithe. You should give that which comes from the inside. And verse 42, then he articulates that, justice and the love of God. These are matters of the heart. They're part of the substance of our souls and the evidence of our character. That doesn't mean that we don't tithe. It doesn't mean that we don't give our, of our external expression. It's just don't ever think that because of the fact that you write the check or the, that you, you know, hang some nice Christmas lights, that that's going to satisfy Christ. He said, it's not. Both. I, I own both. God created both, the inside and the outside. He's looking for substance of character. Now, there's a problem with what Jesus just said, and I'm going to point it out to you. You're going to see it really quickly. And it's not just the problem for me. It's not just a problem for you. It's a problem for the whole world. You see, most people that you know, believe it or not, are kind of like these Pharisees. You're like, what are you talking about? I don't know any Christ, you know, like religious psycho kind of people. They don't have to be religious at all. Listen, here's the nature of the Pharisee. The Pharisee's mindset is, I'm a good person. I'm a good person, I do good things, and if there is a God and if there is a heaven, he should like me and he should invite me to go there. I mean, this is kind of the mindset of the Pharisee. I'm a good person, I do Good things. And then if you ask these people, well, why do you think you're a good person? They'll point to the outside of their pan. They'll say, look at the outside of my pan. Look at what you can see. Compare it to everybody else. Compare it to Hitler. Compare it to Stalin. Compare it to all the evil people in the world. My pan shines compared to them. I've taken my pan in a lot of nice places, and I've, I've not taken my pan in some really bad places. So consequently, I'm a good person compared to everybody else. I'm not like everybody else. I'm a little better. I'm a little cleaner. I'm a little nicer. I'm a little more generous, generally gooder than most people, and I can prove it. And Jesus just said something. If you're that kind of person, look, Jesus just said something you really need to hear. God will inspect the inside of our pan. Now that is a problem. How do I get that? Go just a bit further into Luke 12. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. And what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the rooftops. This is a problem for those of us who believe that our image management, our appearance management will win the day. Jesus says, clearly it won't. Our sparkling exterior will not compensate for our rotten interior. And this really is a problem. Here's why. Because we can't clean the inside of our own pan. Somebody else has to do that. You think about that for a minute. We know it's rotten. We know it needs cleaning. We can shine up the outside and impress everybody with our Christmas lights. But we can't clean the inside of our own pan. If we could... If we could be that good, if we could just kind of clean ourselves up and, 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 and present ourselves before God as all sparkling clean, we wouldn't be here. There wouldn't be a Christmas. There'd be no need for a Jesus Christ. There'd be no need for a cross. See, this is the tension of Christmas, and it is a tension. If we truly believe that a Savior has been born unto us, who is Christ the Lord, it stands to reason that we need a Savior, that we're toast without one. In fact, it stands to reason that we're without hope if we do not have one who saves us from our sin. Now, you've heard this message. Many of you have heard it your whole life. But who gets it? I mean, where does it really sink in? Who responds to this power of Christmas? I'll tell you who. It's the people who can see their sin and acknowledge their predicament. These humble souls get the gospel. I mean, the ones who have no problem telling you, you don't want to smell what's in this pot. It's vile. It's nasty. I need saving. I need cleaning. I can't do it myself. I need a Savior. These are the people who respond to the gospel, and they welcome a Savior into the world and into their hearts. 
But who fails to understand the gospel and consequently misses the entire point of Christmas? <laughs> it's these very people who believe that they're good people who do good things and are entitled to a good heaven when they die. People like the Pharisees. And a lot of those people are all around you. Some of those people are probably here today. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to tell you Jesus is very aggressive about confronting your self-perception. Sometimes he's even kind of ruthless about it, right? He gets kind of right in your grill, and that's what he's doing with these Pharisees. He's saying, can we even acknowledge that the inside of the pan is rotten? Or are we convinced that by virtue of our shiny appearance this Christmas, all is well with the world and we're on our way to heaven? If we can't see the filth within us, a loving Savior will point it out to us. And Jesus loves the Pharisees so much, he's going to continue to point it out to them in verse 43. He says, woe to you Pharisees, which by the way in the Greek is how terrible it will be for you. This is pronouncement of judgment. How terrible it will be for you Pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. And again, Jesus is confronting a very proud group of people who enjoy public attention and privilege due to their religious fervor and their status. They're actually quite well paid to be professional religious people. And you know, once again, this really feeds our culture, doesn't it? Why? Because we're obsessed with appearance. <laughs> I mean, we love the pretty people. We love the beautiful people. We love the people that inspire us because they're good, or they're gooder than most people we know, and we love to celebrate them. We put them on a pedestal. We give them the best seats in the house, right? And who are these shiny, hang the lights kind of people in our society? I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed to say a lot of times it's pastors. Sometimes it's me, sometimes it's you. And if we ever get to the point that we believe our own press and we enjoy these seats of honor that come along with being perceived as a little bit gooder than most, we'll soon qualify for this rebuke from Christ. He'll get right in our face. Why? Let me ask you a question. Do you have any reason to be honored? Do I have any reason to be honored? Did I suffer the cross? Did I clean the inside of my pan? No, neither did you. All praise, honor, and glory belongs to God. And he won't share it with us because it'll corrupt us. And if we buy our own press and we really believe that we're all that, Jesus says it gets worse because not only are you an offense to God, but you're leading other people down this black hole with you. And that's what he says next in verse 44. He states, Woe to you because you are like unmarked graves which men walk over without knowing it. Jesus has a way with words. And he paints a picture here that's deeply disturbing. An unmarked grave is an indiscernible hole in the ground that has a dead body in it. When people unknowingly walked over an unmarked grave, one of two things happened within the ancient Jewish context. Number one, those who walked over that grave would be rendered unclean by exposure to the dead without any knowledge of their condition. And number two, they might just fall right into the hole with the dead body. Either way, the point is clear. Following a Pharisee is a death trap. You either walk blindly into a deadly infection or you fall into a hole that you can't get out of. Listen. I mean, you you can watch TV, you can watch the news, you can listen to any number of people who proclaim to have some degree of wisdom and you will hear over and over again, all that really matters is that you're a good person. Just be a good person, do some good things, and it's all good. Every world religion, with the exception of Christianity, boils down to this concept. I mean, you'll hear things like, you know, God blesses those who are blessing to others, so go be a blessing to others and God will bless you. In other words, do enough good things to get on good, you know, God's good side. Then you'll hear promises that if you, if you do this, you know, then God's going to bless you. If you do what? If you write a check to our ministry, God's going to bless your health. God's going to heal you. God's going to bless. I heard a preacher on the radio the other day say, God's going to bless your bank account. Jesus said, Death trap, every last one of them, unmarked graves. So what is the truth of this whole deal? What is, what is the gospel truth? What is the one thing we can take to the bank? What is Jesus saying without any lack of clarity? He's saying, your pot, your pan that you're so proud of, it's rotten. And God sees it. There's no hiding from God. 
quit saying that you're a good person. There's no good people. We're not good compared to God's standards. If we were all inherently good people like our culture keeps saying, there would be no need for Christmas, there'd be no need for a Savior, there'd be no need for a cross. You're thinking, gosh, Jim, you're getting kind of tough on us here today. You know, Jesus really doesn't sound like the loving Jesus I always thought about. I mean, he sounds kind of confrontational, a little bit harsh. He doesn't sound nice. Let me tell you something. Jesus may not be nice according to your definition of nice, but he is loving. You see, a loving person tells you the truth even if it's at the risk of hurting your feelings. A loving person doesn't hold anything back. They don't enjoy rebuking, but they don't withhold it either. You know, if you go to the doctor and you have cancer, you don't want a nice doctor. You want a loving doctor. A nice doctor is going to put up with all of your, you know, I don't feel like I have cancer. I feel fine. I, you know, I went for a jog this morning, and I've got a lot of travel to do. My family's gone on vacation, and I've got a lot of work to do. I don't really think I have time for this right now. The nice doctor would say, well, I understand. We can just get to it whenever. A loving doctor says, cancel your plans. We're going under the knife today. And we're going to attack this cancer with a vengeance. And it's probably going to take you right to the point of death. You're not going to like it very much, but it's going to save your life. Jesus said, I am the great physician. I have not come for the healthy. I've come for the sick. And what is he saying? He's saying the inside of that pot, it's vile. I need to clean it out. You can't. This is what Christmas is all about. And you know, everyone in the scripture who heard the Lord struggled with this. We struggle with this tension between the exterior and the interior life. Our culture's got it backwards. It says, let's celebrate your shiny exterior. Let's kind of ignore the interior because we all know it's probably not so great, but let's just keep that to ourselves. The Bible says, no, the exterior is all but inconsequential to what's happening on the inside. And Paul struggled with this. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though we are outwardly wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, what? He says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. (laughs) Here's the message for you as you go into Christmas. Don't be a Pharisee. Don't fall in love with your own Christmas lights. Don't be satisfied with external appearance-based spirituality. It's a death trap. It renders Christ irrelevant and unnecessary. The God, listen, the God of all the cosmos does not send his only son into this world to take on our language, to take on our pain, to enter into the kind of suffering, the worst possible kind of suffering, and then suffer on that cross and die as an afterthought or as an add-on or as a nice symbolic gesture for this time of the year. Why does God send his only son? Because we're lost without him. We're terminal without his medicine. We're vile without his cleansing. We're doomed without his saving. So Jesus is the reason for the season. But listen to what the real Jesus, who's no longer a baby in a manger, he's a man who grew to have something to say, and this is what he said. Repent. Fall on your knees. Hear the angels' voices. And then you will know what the good news is. They said it 2,000 years ago. They said, do not be afraid. We bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. That is good news, Amen? amen? Let's pray. Lord, we... Uh, We are so easily deceived in the way that we look at ourselves and the way we look at this world that we would think of the birth of baby Jesus as a, oh, by the way, this is really what the season is about, but let's just get on with our presence and our gifts and all these wonderful trappings of of a tradition that basically hides what's happening inside our souls. So through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, I just pray that everyone within the sound of my voice right now will just kind of come clean with you. It's it's not good. There's a lot of vile stuff inside of me. 
It comes out in the way I talk to my kids or the way I talk to my spouse. It comes out with the way I think and the things I engage in in private. Your word says it's all going to be revealed. It's all going to be put up on a big screen. That what, what we've polished on the outside means nothing to you. It's who we are becoming on the inside. And without you, it only gets worse with time. And so I pray for this intervention, this Savior that would come from heaven above to actually descend into our circumstances and take on the vileness of our, of our hearts and of our character and redeem it, conquer it, that we would actually be crucified with Christ and that we would be a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, the hope of glory. Lord, this is Christmas. And it is our prayer as those who see ourselves as we are and we repent and we ask once again for your spirit to clean us up and send us out that we might engage in justice, that we might demonstrate a love for God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.